This is six lessons learned from creating content. So hi, my name is Mylene. Um, some of you may know that I make videos about lessons in my 20s. So these are some of the videos that I make on Instagram and it basically are, they're just cinematic reels that capture things that I've learned throughout my 20 years of living. Um, today though, I wanted to do something a little bit different and I wanted to share the lessons from my journey of actually creating. So kind of more behind the scenes, what it's been like um, as a content creator over the past year and how my perspectives have sort of, sort of changed throughout this journey. Um, so one year ago, I was here, literally in this room. Uh, so my content journey started off in SF1 here at Buildspace, uh, but it also started off here. I had zero subscribers. I hadn't started my YouTube channel yet. I didn't have Instagram yet. Uh, and I barely had picked up a camera even. So that's kind of where it started. Now I'm here, literally physically in the space again, uh, but also now with more eyes on my content. Uh, but this doesn't actually matter. The numbers don't really mean that much at the end of the day. What really matters and what I really want to focus on in this talk is how my relationship with creating content has changed over the past year. Because I think when you're going through the cycle of creating content, uh, it's really hard to kind of zoom out and see the full picture. And so now that it's been almost a full year of me creating content, I think it's really interesting to just analyze how my perspective on creating has changed over time and what that kind of looks like. So if I were to depict it on a graph, this is kind of what it would look like. So this is basically my relationship with creating content over time and kind of how I felt. As you can see, it's really not linear at all. Uh, so I'm gonna, the basis of this presentation is basically gonna be me digging into different segments of time um, and the things that I learned during those phases of time. So starting off with the very beginning. So this was basically me when I was first getting started in Buildspace SF1, when I was just getting started in creating content. At the time, I was making YouTube videos exclusively. I wasn't really even focusing on Instagram or anything like that. And I was posting one YouTube video per week. Uh, the goal at the time was to hit 5,000 subscribers, but this goal was actually hurting me and I didn't realize it at the time. So this is kind of the graph of what my metrics looked like through that span of creating during build space. I was posting videos every week, but again, there isn't really a big spike of growth. What, and that's what I was thinking or hoping would happen. So each week that I kept showing up and each week that I wasn't blowing up or things, the views weren't hitting what I thought they would, um, I would just feel like even lower and lower. So that's why the relationship of me creating content kind of decreased over time. There would be like the small wins of when I'd post a video, but then it would just go back into a low of wondering why things hadn't yet blown up. And so the first lesson here that I realized was you should really be focusing more on the inputs rather than the outputs. So you can't control who follows you, you can't control how many people view your content, but what you can control is how often you show up. So the next big question I feel like that I often hear is, okay, but how often should I show up? So personally for me, I really don't like daily posting. Uh, I think that that's something that, at least for me, is kind of unrealistic and just makes me feel like I don't have enough time to actually live life and I'm just spending more time editing and you know, making videos, but not actually feeling inspired and living life. So I think my advice when it comes to figuring out a good cadence for how often you should be posting, it's really on picking something that is recurring and still pushes you, but isn't something that takes away from just feeling inspired and being able to actually live your life and experience things and have stories to tell. Uh, so that ties into the second lesson, which is at what point do you go from quantity to quality? So I was talking to another creator. Uh, her name is actually April Lynn. That's Rock's girlfriend, if you remember Rock's. He was also an SF1 uh, person or student in the school. I was talking to her a lot about you know, this journey of creating. And I think a lot of the times, it's really hard to tell when you should kind of sacrifice quality over just posting on a recurring schedule. And one of the pieces of advice that she gave to me and really, really stuck with me was when you know for a fact that you're gonna keep showing up, so for example, if your dream is to become a content creator or your dream is to grow big on YouTube uh, and you know for a fact that that's a goal that you're going to take to the grave basically or it's something that you know for a fact you're going to keep showing up even on the rainy days, then that's when you can kind of start to choose to prioritize quality a little bit more. Um, even when talking to some of the other YouTubers in the SF1 cohort at the time, um, you know, it was always kind of a balance of do I spend two weeks to create this video or a month even to create this video or do I just push something out right away just to get something out there? 
And so I think when you know for a fact that you're going to keep showing up, that's when you can keep you know, spending a little bit of extra time. Because otherwise, you kind of run into a case where if you're still kind of shaky on your goals, you're still not really sure if you have it in you to keep going, if you spend four weeks, six weeks, whatever, on a video, it's very possible that you might just fall off right there and not show up anymore because you felt like you took so long on that video. So when you don't know if you'll keep showing up, I think that's when it's really important to choose consistency. Uh, so moving on to the next part of my journey, at this point in time now, I had just finished SF1 and I'm back into the world trying to figure out what exactly it means to me to continue creating content. Uh, at this point, I felt pretty jaded uh, in terms of metrics and I decided to just kind of toss those out the window. So I started focusing less on the number of subscribers, the number of views, and just finding what actually brings me joy in creating content and what does that actually look like. So at this point in time, again, I started letting go of the metrics and I started spending longer on videos and creating things that I actually like. This is a project that I made which is very unrelated to any of the other content that I had made at the time um, and it was a longer project that involved more people and so it took longer to release but it just really reinvigorated that joy of creating again. And so at that point in time, I also even opened up to experimenting to short form content. Uh, I was actually extremely closed off to short form content at the time because I thought that short form content would restrict me from being able to express my ideas creativity creatively. Uh, but what I actually realized was this new form of content that I was restricting myself from was actually allowing me to experiment with my ideas faster and more often. And so I actually did really enjoy the fact that I started creating more short form content. So at the beginning of my journey, I was creating a lot of pretty random stuff. I wasn't really putting a whole lot of effort into short form content. I was just kind of choosing to post like once or twice uh, a week and not really much was happening here. It was just kind of me getting the reps in and kind of trying to understand this new platform. So I think the most important lesson that came in in this point of time and one that you'll probably hear me say a lot, especially if you talk to me afterwards or even just in a lot of the stuff that I do right now, it's learning how to have fun again. I think this has been one of the most pivotal learnings for me and the biggest perspective shifts that I've had in creating content because fun is really what takes an idea from a thought to a finished video most consistently. And fun is what keeps you trying new things even when you feel like things are tough or you want to give up. Fun is the thing that keeps you long enough to see you win because people usually quit before they even have a chance to see the benefits or um, their hard work pay off. And so as long as you focus on keeping things fun and enjoying the process, then it'll, that's probably one of the most surefire ways of guaranteeing that you'll stick around and be alive long enough to see that hard work pay off. So I think one of the biggest questions that you might have is, but how will making stuff for fun actually help me? You know, is making something silly or random actually going to turn into something one day? And I think a lot of people think too much when they're creating content about what other people want to see, but they're missing a really fundamental thing about what they actually want to create. And so this leads to this thing that I call the cycle of frustration. So you've probably run into this cycle before if you've tried creating content on your own, where you have that initial excitement where you're just like, oh, I'm so excited to create something. And then you create that thing, maybe it flops or it doesn't do as well as you thought it would. And you try to look at what works and you're researching all these things. You're looking at retention editing, you know, the attention economy. You're looking at all these hacks and all these things that maybe don't really resonate with you, but you try anyways because everyone says they work. But a fundamental thing is missing from this cycle and that is purely just fun. It's understanding what is actually fun for you to create and what you actually enjoy. And so at this point in time in my Instagram or my content journey, um, I was creating stuff that didn't really provide value for anyone, but it was just really fun for me to make. Um, so at the time I was in Japan for a little bit uh, and I was just making these really cinematic reels of just beautiful things that I saw. And these didn't get that much views. I know it looks like it has thousands, but literally um, this only happened after my other content started blowing up. So these had maybe like a few hundred views at the time, um, if even. And so eventually, as you start creating more things just for fun, you start to gain momentum again. And after you start to gain momentum, that's when you can start to look at the intersection of fun and impact. So I think, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about how most people kind of look too much at how can I add value to others, um, I think one way that you can kind of merge or, inter or intersect the two is first thinking about what interests you. So again, what is something that you actually want to create? What is something that genuinely 
brings you joy and you know you feel excited about and then from there you can start to tailor into a lens of how might this apply to others so for example with my lesson series um, it was interesting to me because I always do end of year reflections I always kind of reflect on the year and so whenever I was making one of those videos I would then think about okay how might this apply to others well they might be thinking about similar things they might be you know curious to learn about how I've navigated things that they might experience and that helped me tailor what I was creating in a way that kind of hit both boxes of both being fun for myself, but then also being applicable or adding value to others. So moving on in time of my content journey, uh, th at this point in time, my relationship with creating content, as you can see, was improving as I was prioritizing more of what actually drove me, what was like actually fun for me. And at this point in time, I was trying to navigate uh, a lot of different things. So I was creating the series, the 23 Lessons in 2023 series, and this is when I learned that it's really, really important to experiment with intention. I think that when it comes to content creation in particular, uh, there's a lot of variables that come to mind, right? There's what platforms to use, what styles, um, does gear actually matter? There's a lot of different things that you can experiment with, and it's really hard to actually tell what's working because there's just too many variables at stake. And so I think one thing that I wanna really dig into is how I experimented with my 23 lessons in 2023 series and kind of what I learned from that. Uh, so I think that creating content is very much so like baking a cake. Uh, you can choose different ingredients and there's a lot of different aspects to it. There's your theme, there's the script, there's the hook, music, visuals. Um, there's all these different components that can be combined in so many different ways uh, to produce different results. And so 23 Lessons from 2023 was my cake, essentially. And so as you can see here, uh, I, for my first six or my first five videos of this series, I had the same introduction. So I had this match cut introduction as like one piece of the cake or one ingredient of the cake. And none of these videos really popped off, but the one that did happened to be the next one, which is one where, oh. Twice before taking someone else's advice. Welcome to lesson six of 23 things I learned in 2023. Okay, so you can kind of see the difference here where it's like for this one, I started off all five of the videos the same way. And if you're a viewer who's just scrolling through your feed, it looks like it's all the same video uh, because you just see the same match cuts every single time. And I didn't really realize that. And so when I experimented suddenly with introducing the hook first, like what you saw in the, next, in the, the last slide, um, that was the video that actually blew up. And because I had so many other videos of a similar nature, uh, those other videos started to blow up as well. And so it gave a lot of people something to latch onto and keep following along rather than just having one viral video and then people kind of forget about you after. So I think that this way of experimentation is really important because uh, there's a consistent theme across the whole series. So people kind of know what to expect but there's a lot of room for you to experiment with your style and how you edit, the visuals that you use, how you tell your story. And so I think when you think about experimentation, try to reduce the amount of variables there while still having some kind of consistent theme that allows you to be flexible in different ways. Um, so this brings me to now lesson number five. Uh, so before things started to blow up with that series, uh, there was a point in time where again, I was kind of questioning like, what am I really doing? Is this really gonna pay off? I wasn't really sure where things were headed at the time. And so I remember I was reaching out to Farza and a few other people just asking for feedback, asking them what they thought about my content. And this was a message that really stuck with me that Farza said, and uh, you guys can kind of read it on the screen, but the TLDR of this message is basically, how can you look outside of what you're doing right now and control your own destiny? Are there other things that you can do outside of just making content that can increase your odds? And so for me, this really got me thinking about what I was doing because at this point in time, I felt like I was making something that resonated with what I liked, it was fun. Uh, the only missing piece was I was just wondering why people weren't seeing it because I felt really confident in it. I got really good feedback from like some of my peers and things like that, but it still, it still wasn't really blowing up. And so what I realized was if the right people aren't coming to you, you have to go find them. 
And so I think one of the most important things outside of even just creating content is also just finding other people in your community or in the niche that you're interested in. And so I spent a lot of time on Instagram just looking for creators who I resonated with, creators who inspired me and creators who uh, I thought I could learn from. And from there, I actually found, for example, Adrian Purr. And he had this Discord community at the time where he would literally do work reviews. And he would just review people's work and give them feedback. But most people, again, and they're so busy with creating that they don't think to go find these things or they don't think to go find these um, resources. And so this right here, uh, I know there's no sound, uh, but I remember I went into Adrian's work review. I submitted the video that I made on YouTube of the, like, the Dear Strangers, uh, so getting strangers to read letters. And him and his girlfriend literally cried on stream watching the video. And that was like a huge motivation for me. So even though at the time I didn't have the validation of you know, all these views or followers, uh, what kept me going was knowing that big creators or people who I looked up to, like Adrian, were still acknowledging my work. And so if you don't get the attention that you want, uh, just go find those people. Go see where they're at and try to make them notice you. I think that was probably one of the biggest things that I had learned in my journey. So eventually, after continuing to do all these things, continuing to show up, continuing to try to find other creators, uh, my account blew up. And people ended up finding my other work, as I mentioned before, which kind of just continued on this loop of um, growth. So it may sound like everything is going great and everything is going well. Uh, so why is there another dip? Well, I think one thing that's really interesting is that you think that going viral will solve all of your problems um, and that life will suddenly be different. But I remember when I blew up, I was just in my bedroom. It was like December, right before the holidays. And I was like sick because I had just come back from Japan. And I was just thinking to myself like, wow, nothing, nothing really changed. I don't really know what I was expecting uh, to happen after I went viral. But life was very much the same. And so I think this, again, just goes back to the whole message that imposter syndrome doesn't really go away. And so if you think that virality or going big is going to solve your problems, uh, the truth is it's not. And the most important thing, again, is just finding joy in the process, which is why I keep kind of going back to that theme of just learning how to have fun. Um, so yeah, going viral won't solve your problems. Refer back to lesson three, which is learn how to have fun again. Um, so I guess for me, uh, another big part of kind of having fun in the journey was not making content my whole life. Uh, so I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but I actually ended up signing on to a full-time job in January of this year. And I think a lot of people assume that when you go viral or when you make it big, um, you're just going to kind of go full-time on being a content creator. Uh, but I think for me, again, just as someone who is still trying to feel or still trying to figure out what my style is and what I really want to do with content creation, um, for me, getting a job at the time was a really good choice for me just because I was able to now um, do content as something that was more of a fun outlet and not necessarily rely on it as my main livelihood or source of income. And so I think that's just something to think about because uh, I think a lot of people, again, kind of idealize this whole creator lifestyle. Uh, but the thing about that is once you start creating and you know you rely on sponsorships and in as like your main source of income uh, once you start like once you stop creating so does the money like the money also stops coming in and so that's just something that I'm like transparently also trying to navigate right now in my point in time of content of how do I actually turn this into a lifestyle and is that something that I even actually want and so for me at least right now having a job is just something that allows me to keep content fun and allows me to experiment without having to worry about for example like my engagement rates or things like that tanking um, so yeah, this is kind of where I am right now. Uh, still trying to continually improve my relationship with creating content and learn along the way. And I'm still trying to find my style. I think that uh, as much as I feel like I've found something that works for me, uh, as a creative, you're always trying to figure out how can you be better? Or how can you continue showing up in new creative ways? And so for me, I'm trying to find my style. And I think the thing that I've realized in this process is that the biggest differentiator is you at the end of the day. And so I think that if you show up authentically, you show up as you, then that's kind of the best way to guarantee that the right people will find you. I think we often hear the case 
case of people who go viral off of one video, but it's not actually something that they like creating. And then they end up kind of stuck in that niche. And so I think if there's one thing to keep in mind, and this is like pretty generic stuff, but I think it's a good reminder, is that if you just show up as yourself and um, you know, do things that you're uniquely positioned to do, I think that's the biggest differentiator that you have against any other creators at the end of the day. So show up as you as much as possible and create more, consume less, stay creating. So that's my, that's my talk. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has any questions, but. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Um, I've been working on my YouTube channel for a couple of years. Um, this. SF2, I got to a few hundred, I went from like maybe 300 to 700 subscribers and I actually started to monetize it. Um, the, my biggest fear was basically, will monetizing make it less fun? Um, it did make it less fun. <laughs> and that definitely comes down to like, um, trying to find an authentic relationship with the sponsors. I'm trying to find something that feels like I'm still creating what I wanna create and that is actually authentic. Um, yeah, I'm still learning a lot about that, but I was just wondering if you had anything else to say about that. Yeah, yeah, so thanks for sharing that, by the way. I think it's like always interesting to hear people's perspectives, but in case anyone didn't hear what his question was, it was basically like, um, when it comes to monetizing your content, do you often also have the feeling of like, oh, this doesn't feel as fun, so how do you kind of find the balance of still doing these things and having fun? Um, I think for me, I've definitely started to see that as well where I remember like with one of my first sponsored things, um, it was my first time creating stuff with creative constraints basically. Cause obviously sponsors and things like that, they have certain um, like rules or certain like constraints that they want you to follow. And so it was the first time in a while that I felt a little bit creatively constrained. And so I definitely felt that. I think that um, one thing that helps with that, like you said, is just one, having a really good relationship with the brand and just being really picky and selective with who you collaborate with. Um, so again, I guess it really depends on your goals at the end of the day and if content is your main source of income. Um, but for me at least, I try to be very selective and work with brands that either I currently use or really care about. Um, Cause I think it's inevitable that you're gonna run into those creative constraints. Um, but I try to look at them as creative challenges and just like ways to think differently. Because as much as I know about how my style works now um, and kind of how I like to create, it is kind of cool sometimes to just like experiment and try creating things through the lens of what a brand wants. Uh, but yeah, obviously not as fun as creating stuff completely unrestricted. Um, so one of the things that I really struggle with is sticking to like a cadence mm. and like actually following through. Like I'll write like a routine like okay I'm gonna post this day, this day, this day. But like I don't know I just can't follow it for some reason. I'm not sure if you have experience with that or like if you do then like what advice would you give to someone kind of struggling with it? Yeah, so the question was basically, um, how do you stay consistent? Like, how do you um, keep going with a recurring sort of like schedule? I think the biggest thing is being realistic with yourself. And um, I think that a lot of the times it just comes down to like making sure that that cadence is something that is realistic with our current lifestyle as well. I think it's again really easy to see people who are doing like these daily challenges or these different things that make us feel pressured to follow in that kind of pattern. Uh, but I think the most important thing is, you know, let's say you're posting three times, or sorry, like every three days or something, and you're finding that you're still kind of struggling with that. Maybe you try like once a week or like once every other week, just some sort of cadence, mm -hmm. um, even if it's a bit like, a bit wider of a cadence, and then from there, slowly start to close the gap as you get more comfortable with that cadence. Yeah, that's good advice, thank you. Um, so obviously you've been creating content for about a year now, you said. Like, how did you find like the start of your journey? Like, how did you kind of get the momentum to like kind of keep going? Yeah, 
Uh, so creating content, or sorry, the question was, uh, how did I kind of get started my journey and find the initial push to start? Um, I think for me, the biggest thing was I actually had wanted to create content for the past decade. Uh, it's been something that like I've always really looked up to different YouTubers. Like I feel like everyone kind of has a similar childhood where they just watch like their favorite YouTubers and they're like, ah, it would be cool to live that kind of life. Um, and so I think for me, I had always wanted to start creating, especially throughout university, but I was just really shy and I was really scared of what my classmates or peers around me would think. And so I purposely waited for after I graduated uh, to actually get started because I knew it was re like reducing some of the variability of you know, having to show up to class every day and wonder what people were thinking. And so for me, personally at least, that was like a decision that I made to wait until after I graduated um, to then start creating. And I think Build Space was also a big push for that, right? Like being surrounded by other people who are also trying to do different things, I think that was really helpful in just helping me get started and push forward and actually create that first video. Yes, Jed. Can you tell us a little bit more about when you found Adrian's community? Like, what was the unlock there? Was it just a feedback, or was it just like combination of different things? Mm -hmm. Was it what? It, what was the unlock of finding Adrian's community? Yeah, like finding the right people. Yeah, I think the biggest thing wasn't even the feedback, because to be honest, there wasn't a lot of feedback that I received from him. I think it was just the feeling of like finally being seen. Um, and finally feeling like I was around people who were chasing after similar goals in a way that was most aligned with my niche. Because like, yes, for example, like technically in build space, I was around other content creators as well. But the type of content that I was making was a little bit more like niche or specific. Um, and so finding people who were creating those niche specific things was really interesting. And so I remember on that day that I was like on that work review stream and I was watching um, other projects, but also like him watching mine. I just remember I felt like so inspired after that because um, it just kind of pushed the bounds of what is possible. Um, just seeing how talented those other people were and wanting to also chase uh, that bar of quality. Uh, you mentioned build space being a big boost. Um, and given that it's SF2 is like almost over, basically, we have a couple mm -hmm. weeks left. Um, I notice, well, when, when SF1 ended, I saw a few people from SF1 posting on Twitter about how depressing it was and the transition <laughs> was like super hard. So I guess, do you have any advice for us when Build Space ends, how to transition back? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, so yeah, the question was basically, do you have any advice for transitioning out of you know, SF2 or SF1 and into the real world again? Um, I think the biggest thing is I was talking to Ahmed about this actually recently, but I feel like after a program like this, it's very much so like sink or swim. Uh, you know, you kind of see some people either continue on the, the same path or they just kind of go back into whatever like their, their life before uh, SF1 or 2 looked like. And so I think there's like a few different pieces of advice that I would give. One of them for sure is just keep in touch with the people who you've like got grown close to in your cohort. I think that like even some of the people who I sat around uh, back there, I still keep in touch with and we still chat regularly. And so I think it's really, really hard to find that type of community sometimes. Uh, and so just making sure that you put in the time to prioritize that and keep in touch with those people, I think that's something that'll at least sustain some of that momentum and motivation a little bit longer. Um, but I think another thing too I, that is really important is I think the transition out of like the BuildSpace school or BuildSpace SF2 is really important and necessary. I think that as much as at the time I was like, oh, I wish I could keep doing this forever, I think that if I did go back to my hometown, go back into like regular life, I don't think I would have stumbled across like what I have now. Because I think being alone again kind of forced me to look at things in a different way. Because uh, when I was in this environment, I was very much so just like on a like grind every single week. And it was really, really hard again to zoom out and see the bigger picture. And so when I finally like graduated from the school, I think I was able to have a little bit more clarity and see the full picture because I actually had time to slow down and reflect and what was going on. So I think afterwards, definitely take time uh, to just think about everything that happened and think about what you want moving forward. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, so I have kind of more of like a, I guess like technical, like when you're creating videos questions. So I feel like you do a really good job of like making it feel like a really intimate conversation. Like 
with the viewer through the camera. I feel like sometimes when I make videos talking to the camera, like it's like quite obvious I'm just like talking to a camera. So what are some like tactics you use for filming or speaking to kind of like create that intimate feeling? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's very, very hard at the start, yeah, to feel natural talking in front of a camera. Um, it's something that I definitely struggled with a lot, especially in the early days. Uh, I remember I couldn't even like look at the camera lens because it felt weird because it was just like, I'm looking into some black hole right now. Uh, but honestly, I think it's just one of those things where it just takes like putting in the reps to get used to it. And so I think for me, like even when I first started the 23 lesson series, it would take me a full day to just film the video, not even edit it. It would take me a full day to film it and a, then another full day to edit it. Um, now I can get the whole process down in like maybe three or four hours. Um, but a lot of that just came from getting like practice in and just continuing to show up and do it. So there are going to be a lot of times where you cringe and you're just like, oh, and you're, or there will be days where you're frustrated and you literally take the same clip like 20 times. Uh, but that's okay because that's just part of the process. And over time, it does eventually get smoother and easier. How do you leverage ChatGPT in your creation process? <laughs> I do not currently. Um, I used to play around with it a little bit. Uh, like I remember when GPTs started becoming like a really big thing, I made like a thumbnail sort of like advice giver to just like help me pick between two thumbnails or like two titles for YouTube videos. Um, but at the moment, no, I don't use it at, at all. I think like to touch on my creative process a little bit. Um, the way that I come up with ideas now oftentimes is just on the fly. And so I think that like having backlogs of ideas and things like that, um, what I end up finding happening is that they just like accumulate. And I just have like all these stale ideas that go dry because if I don't act on them right away, I lose the initial interest and inspiration behind them. And so that's why like using ChatGPT for like ideas doesn't really work for me just because I'm like someone who really thinks about things on the fly and then from there tries to act on them as soon as possible. Um, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I relate with you a lot on the thing that like ideas get stale mm. like pretty fast for me I'm also pretty intuitive and like I want myself to be interested in the process as well that's yeah. why I have like so many files like 30 to 40 <laughs> production files that like I started working on like but I just did not complete them mm. and my challenge is that I love to work intuitively and on the fly but what's the mindset like to still be consistently putting stuff out or consistently being intuitive and open to the process of ideas coming to your head? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how to summarize that question, so I'm just gonna answer it. Uh, but I would say, I actually faced that recently. Um, so I was trying to get back into creating more YouTube videos, because again, I've been like really focused on Instagram for the past little bit. And I remember I have like all this old footage back from Japan, and there's like so many videos that I still want to create from that footage. Um, but as many times as I sit down and try to edit it, it just like stays there forever. And it just like leaves me feeling kind of like shitty because I'm just like, why can I not push this out there? Like I know I like the idea, why can't I get it out there? And so um, something that I did recently was, uh, I remember on the fly, I just came up with another idea that was like completely unrelated. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna make this video instead and just release this. So at least like it helps me get back into the momentum of posting again. Um, and I can always decide afterwards if I still want to keep those old ideas or honestly just start fresh and keep making like new things on the fly. And so I think, yeah, trust your intuition and follow what feels easiest for you. Um, because those ideas, again, if they really are something that you want to create and put out there, you'll eventually find time for them again. But I think that there's something really powerful of that initial like activation energy of finding a new idea and being excited about it. And that, I think, leads to the best results because, again, you're not overthinking it. You're just kind of going based off of what you think is best as an artist. Yeah. Um, 
Can you touch a bit more on your creative process? Like mm -hmm. how you go from idea to like finished video and like kind of how long it takes and like what, what your steps are? Yeah, yeah. So the question was about like what is my creative process and kind of how I go from idea to actual video. Um, I think it's definitely been something that I thought about a lot over time. But I think right now what it kind of looks like is basically, um, so earlier this year, again, in the whole spirit of like trying to keep things fun, I don't have a pretty like good system, so I have no really good answer for what this looks like. So if it sounds like scattered and disorganized, that's why. Um, I even tried like creating notions or like things like that. But honestly, like my creative process right now is just contained in a chaos of my Apple Notes because usually what'll happen is again like if I have an idea, and oftentimes it's like at night when I'm in bed, um, I, I will literally just start typing up what that idea is and what I. I do first is I'll write down a script and so basically like talking points what exactly is it that I'll say and usually I'll be able to like finish a whole script in maybe like 30 minutes or so and then I'll go to bed look at it the next morning see if anything like I need to fix or if it still resonates with me and then I'll try to film it in the next day or two um, but actually the step between like the script and filming, uh, what I'll then do after I have like each line in the script is I'll literally just put another line above each script line that says what's the shot that I'm trying to like take with it. And so that way when I go to film, I kind of have in mind all the shots already planned. Um, Cause for me at least, if I go out and film without that, then it's really, really hard and it takes like double the time if I don't know what I'm shooting. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much like the creative process of that. And then from there, I'll just go edit in DaVinci. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much the process, I guess. <laughs> what is one thing people get wrong about content creation when getting started on? What is one thing people get wrong when getting started on creating content? Um, let's see. Honestly, I think it goes back to what I was saying in the presentation earlier. I think um, it makes sense but I think it also like is a hindrance where people just think a lot about what can I make that will add value to others? Because they think that them just showing up and them just creating something isn't going to be valuable enough for people to pay attention. And so they start to over-optimize and think a little bit too much about how they can create something that'll appeal to the masses rather than what will actually appeal to themselves. And so I think that's where, again, it's really important to just think about what is actually interesting to you. And you kind of do just have to have that like self-belief that what you're saying matters and people will care about it. Um, like if you think about it, there's like a bunch of really random stuff on the internet, like stuff that goes viral for no reason. And so uh, as long as you have that belief in yourself that what you're putting out there will be valuable, um, eventually over time the right people will find you. You just have to keep showing up. And so yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I see people go wrong is they're creating for other people and not themselves. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you said you spent like 10 years kind of want thinking about it and everything. And um, I, I'm, I don't think you really tackle like very controversial stuff or anything, but do you ha have you, was any part of that like a fear of, you know, uh, people criticizing or dealing with hate or like any of that stuff? And if so, like, have you created any ways to deal with that sort of aspect of things? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, so basically around like, how do you deal with hate or have I ever worried about dealing with hate and things like that. Um, I think it's definitely been something that I've thought about before. Um, I've never really dealt with any like really bad hate. I, I think like being a founder in, the, in my in, like a past life, I think I've faced probably more hate or like potentially controversial things from that. Um, but I think again at the end of the day it just like goes back down to remembering why you're creating something in the first place. Um, and then just trying to stay true to that. I think uh, a big part of it is like the self-confidence piece and kind of getting yourself to a place where, again, you just have such a strong conviction as to what you're creating and why you're creating that even if people are hating on it or they're saying things, you're still very, very stuck on that why and, and how, I guess. I don't know if that's a good answer, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if for the for the series you're creating now, if you consider it a cake, what is the thing that you've been experimenting with the most? Hmm. So, I guess I'll go with process of elimination of what I think I've been experimenting with the most. Um, Script-wise, I feel for the most part, I 
talk in a very similar style for every single video and kind of what that looks like. So I think for me, it's like visuals and the order of the visuals. I think that's like the main thing that I experiment with. Um, and so whether that's like including the hook at the beginning or like putting some kind of question at the end to make people thinking or looping the video so that like they keep watching it. I think it's really just like the structure of the video and the visuals that I overlay. Uh, like something that I thought about a lot is there are a lot of cuts in my videos now in a sense that like there's like so many angles and so many different things happening. Um, I have been very curious about testing out whether or not if I stripped away all those like visuals and like changes, would people still stick around just for like the actual narrative and the story? And so that's something that I'm actually trying to experiment with recently is like if I post a video that's just me talking and there's not a bunch of cuts, what will happen? Um, so I think, yeah, that's kind of what I experiment with most, most is just like the visuals and the order in which they show. Thank you. Oh wait, the mic. <laughs> Apart from Instagram, YouTube, and uh, that uh, work with video, like mm -hmm. workspace, whatever it was, uh, what are some of the other avenues that you use to like connect with people? Um, I think also, or another avenue that I use to connect with people is probably just going to in-person events and things like that. Um, so I guess this depends on what city you live in, but usually there are little pockets of creators in different areas. Uh, and so I think trying to find those in-person events is really important. Uh, so yeah, I think a lot of it is just like searching. I think with any new platform, there's always that feeling of like, oh, this is like a really new platform. I don't really know how to navigate it or who exists in this space. Uh, but the more that you like actively seek those things, the more you'll start to notice the same names. And to me, like that's kind of the indicator of like, oh, I kind of am starting to understand this niche or this circle is when I'm starting to hear people know the same <coughs> names or like the same people. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of like a good indicator of like when you've started to really close in on that, that niche and found that like kind of community there. Um, the interesting thing with me right now actually is, I don't know, this one like is something that's still like half baked of a thought in my head too, but something that I've been thinking about, uh, about recently a lot is just like right now, I'm actually trying to distance myself a little bit from the niche that I've been in, just because I think that like, again, in order to find my style and be creative, um, as much as I love watching the people who inspire me, uh, I've been trying to just like kind of go into my own little cave and try to figure out what styles like and ideas I can come up completely on my own. Because I think like, again, it's kind of like that thing where if you're in a friend group, you start to adopt the same little like things, nuances of how you speak. And so I'm trying to actually like go on that kind of journey right now of just like separating myself from the community a little bit and seeing what I can come up with completely on my own without outside influence. Mm. Yeah, so kind of a different take too on community, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks.